All right, welcome back to the Daily Fantasy Flex podcast. This is the PGA version on Tuesday night. I am here with our usual host. I am here with Peter Jennings, a.k.a. CSU Ram 88. Pete, what's up, man? Oh, another day. Looking forward to a fun week here of DFS. Uh, NBA is kind of winding down, and, uh, you know, PGA is the thing that's on tap. It was a fun tournament to watch last week. Colin was definitely right about Jason Day in terms of uh, the studs to watch for, and uh, excited to learn from him on this pod. I, uh, I'm intimidated by this field, but Colin, he seems excited for it. So I'm, I'm uh, pumped to learn from him. Yeah, no, I, I think it actually might be a, a good pod, a good tournament. Um, obviously, a little bit of a lesser field than what we will see in the following week, which is Masters week. Um, so, yeah, definitely a you know, good stretch of PGA, I think, coming up here in the summer. Uh, and obviously, that kind of alludes to our next guest, which is our, our director of PGA, Colin. What's going on, man? Hey, Brian. Hey, Peter. How's it going? Um, yeah, it's just like you said, I love these uh, these no-name tournaments because they're people that, by definition, you won't ever be able to see on TV. Yeah. And so this is a pure, this is as, as data-driven as it gets, where like the, yeah. I think the edge you can find is if you really have like all the numbers in one place, you can do a lot more objective-based decisions uh, than anyone else. And uh, that, that's a huge source of edge. Yeah. Sounds great. So let's let's get right into it, just so we can uh, get to sort of the the data part as much as possible. Uh, so obviously, we're talking about the Puerto Rico Open, uh, which is going to be played. The, the tee times start at six a.m. So make sure to get your lineups in, whether you are a uh, person who wakes up early and does that on Thursday, or whether you get your lineups in on Wednesday night. Uh, definitely early start. Uh, they're playing at Cocoa Beach, which is in uh, in Puerto Rico, obviously. Um, and kind of want to just kind of talk what course it is. Uh, I thought it was interesting. You kind of look at the course history uh, in recent winners. Uh, we have Alex uh, Ketchka, I think is how you pronounce his name. I'm not sure. Uh, he shot a seven under last year, uh, 2014. Uh, Hadley minus 21. Scott Brown minus 20. George McNeil minus 16. Uh, and then Michael Bradley um, in, you know, five years ago. Um, I think it's the same uh, USA soccer captain. He's just multi-talented in sports. That is correct. I don't yeah. take I don't take shots in, uh, on goal into account in any of our player stats, but I know we're going to look into doing that going forward. Yeah, I bet it's super predictive. So yeah. it is. Yes. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so interesting. So I, I think kind of the thing that stands out is you know we have minus twenty one, minus twenty, minus sixteen, minus sixteen. Then last year minus seven. Um, Colin, Pete, have you guys looked into, you know, what, what's, what gives with the low score here? Um, I think the simplest explanation is just it was really windy last year compared to all other years. I took a look at kind of like average uh, the wind speed we have in our database. And like normally it hovers around like, you know, 13, 14 miles an hour in years past. It was 28 last year. So like something like double the wind, meaning like half the high score, which – Sounds about right, actually, in terms of uh, net effect on scoring. Um, I think this year it's going to be similarly windy, so it'll probably be like closer to last year instead of years past. Um, and so the only thing to really keep an eye on is just the wind differential between the tee times, because if it's mm. equally windy for all, like generally, that just means that it, there's no like someone, there's no one you, you prefer over another if everybody gets the same high wind in general. Yeah, but if it's definitely if it's windy more in the afternoon, then obviously that definitely changes things. So, that, so what, I guess the point is to monitor that for sure. Yeah, as always, always yeah. monitor late breaking tea times and wind. Cool. Um, so, do we know anything about the course? I mean, obviously, uh, it's it's in Puerto Rico. We know that, um, but they've they've played it recently. So, do we have any data or you know, kind of um, you know what it sets up? Is it a longer course, shorter course? Do you guys have any any insights into that? Yeah, I took a look at the my little course fit routine that I have and just looking at who's coming out like plus versus minus, it looks like it's set up for the bombers. Uh, and that is pretty aligned again with conventional wisdom. Data says it's a bomber's course. Everyone else says it's a bomber's course, plays a little longer. So if you just want to simplify your key stats to look at, just I would give driving distance a boost, maybe around like five, like up, up to five to seven points maybe in your player models on uh, Fantasy Labs. Cool. Yep. One other thing too that I noticed from the par fives, it looks like the par fives, uh, I know it's a bombers course, but one interesting mm -hmm. aspect, two of the par fives, it looks like it's going to be a three shot hole uh, regardless, um, unless 
something crazy happens, but just looking at the scorecard and just some of the scoring, it looks like a couple of the par fives are three shot holes regardless, but still uh, it's a driving course. And there's definitely some interesting options that, that hit the ball a long ways, but don't necessarily hit it accurately. And then you factor in the wind. Uh, it's going to be a, an interesting week to say the very least. Yeah, uh, I definitely agree. Uh, so but kind of before we get into, uh, I think some, I definitely want to talk about some some of the stats that are, I think are going to be important before we get into the sort of the player tier breakdowns that we're, we're going to do. Um, I think uh, interesting you note about the tournament is that this is the first year that the uh, the Open is being played the same week as the the WGC match play, uh, which is obviously where all the the great the best players in the world are going to be. So, uh, which obviously kind of uh, dips the field a little bit. So, you know, you're not going to have the elite golfers in this tournament. Um, you know, so we kind of were talking about before the podcast, but kind of just wanted to, to get your guys' thoughts on this. You know, does this make it better for you guys? You know, the fact that, you know, you're going to have some, some of the lesser golfers and maybe less data to go off, or is this just kind of a, a tough week to sort of predict? Uh, Pete, what are your thoughts on that? It definitely makes it tougher for me. Um, but knowing that we have all the data here at Fantasy Labs and, and Colin's uh, done a lot of work on this stuff and loves these tournaments, I'm excited about it. Uh, in general, these are the tournaments I wouldn't play as much volume uh, mm-hmm. in the past, but certainly makes sense to me that this is, uh, you know, a much more data-driven approach. And, uh, yeah, I'm excited for it. I think that um, there's going to be some plays that are guys that I really don't know anything about that are going to look really good based on the numbers and mm-hmm. I'll watch some of them on TV. So I think a lot of people don't know these guys. So from just a game theory standpoint in terms of tournaments, I imagine ownership will kind of be spread out. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. since there's so many guys. And really, I think anyone's in contention. I mean, if you look at it, Graham Dillette is the favorite. Uh, that guy yep. can't make a putt. Like, I honestly feel like I'm relatively close to him in putting. Uh, <laughs> he's that bad at putting. Uh, and he's my favorite. Um, anyone can win this thing. So, it's definitely uh, – I'm, I'm just really excited to hear Colin's takes on this because I don't know most of these guys or I don't know some of these guys for sure. And, uh, you know, it's definitely going to be a data-driven thing based on, you know, what we have here at Fantasy Labs. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it is interesting because, you know, we, we've talked about how correlated uh, Vegas odds, odds to win the tournament or whatever is with pricing. So kind of no matter the tournament, you know, we obviously Graham to let, um, you know, any of these guys, you know, William McGurr is, is kind of another guy who is, is high. Um, Scott Brown is obviously, you know, has high odds to win. These guys would be really cheap um, or, or relatively cheap on, on kind of a normal week. Uh, but just because they kind of adjust for the odds, these guys are high. You know, Graham Dillette is 11K. Um, so you kind of have to adjust your thinking. And, and I do think there's going to be sort of, you know, you have to get over biases. You know, it, paying 11K for Graham Dillette is going to be hurtful for, for some people, I think. But, uh, you know, I think it's something interesting. Uh, Colin, I know you have some thoughts. I think you really love these sort of weeks, huh? Oh, absolutely. I think um, if the – if I ever have an edge over the field, it's going to be making better object decisions, and people could still beat me in subjective. But if you don't know the players, then you can't really make subjective decisions unless you really follow a lot of these people. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think people agree that it's like it's better. These types of things where the field is really weak is not only a data-driven tournament in general, yeah. but I think in, for fantasy labs in particular, um, it fits our data really well because. Uh, a lot of people are relying on strokes gain type metric. And I know like that, that was in my article this week. Again, it's my ongoing one man crusade against strokes gained. And uh, that was plenty. There was plenty of that in the article this week too, but there are guys in the field here who don't have a single like tournament with shot link data in it. So right. you have, have so, I mean, clearly somebody has opinion on how good they are because they have a price they have vegas odds and yep. so for the people that are too reliant on shot link data i think our data gives an edge here because we're able to properly just conventional data kind of capture the value of like all the stuff that shot link does and give them a, a decent grounded opinion so i think every even among the data driven crowd that are looking at this tournament there are gaps in their data that like this is the tournament where those chickens kind of come home to roost and they're all running with blind spots that they may not know they even have. One other yeah. real quick thing sure. to just thinking about this tournament and just this type of thing in DFS, my favorite DFS sport is college football, you know, probably not going to be able to play next year based on what I'm you know, seeing in regulations, rest in peace. 
daily fantasy college football. But <laughs> one of the best things about it was playing guys who I knew were really good because I followed them. They're, you know, smaller schools, but uh, no one had ever heard of them. And that kept ownership down and people didn't know, like it's very easy in basketball to know to play Harden and Westbrook and Durant tonight. Uh, if you don't know these guys, that's very tough uh, for the public. So I think there's inherently an advantage, especially if you have good data on all the players. So it definitely makes sense to me that there's an edge here. Just my PGA approach in the past was much more on the subjective side and line movement, things of that nature. And now that we have this data, uh, it should be pretty interesting and definitely excited to test it out here for this tournament. Yeah, no, for sure. And, uh, you know, we can kind of transition into the sort of uh, stat uh, part of the, the show, kind of talking about that. And, and I think I, it is a good uh, start to uh, – a good spot to start is, is Colin's article. Uh, one guy that I, you know, I had mentioned in our, our email thread that we were talking about before this podcast, uh, which I think is kind of a great example of uh, – potentially of what you're talking about here, Colin is, is a guy like Dean Burmester who is making his PGA tour debut. Um, he it's rated pretty high on your models. Um, you know, his, his odds to win are, are pretty decent. They're 2.9. Uh, he has some really good metrics as far as green and regulations and uh, crushes the ball. His driving distance is ridiculous. And we talked, you know, just a second ago about how this course really set us up for bombers and he's been crushing the ball. The problem is, you know, if you rely on these, uh, you know, shots gains metric, you're going to have nothing on Burmester, right? So it, it's just kind of uh, uh, maybe uh, an example of why you could use just traditional metrics and you can get, you know, well, obviously we have data on the stuff that he's played outside of the PGA, um, which could be a little more indicative of, you know, what we'd expect this week as opposed to if you rely on, um, you know, shots gained or, or whatever sort of, uh, of metrics you're not going to maybe find guys like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is the, the premier week for that kind of approach. Um, and just to give everyone um, a little bit more context, this article this week was all about trying to see how much information we can extract from conventional data to mirror what we get at a, a strokes gained, something like strokes, strokes gained tee to green or strokes gained putting. So I did this whole, and the, the summary version of it is you can capture 80% of the information in strokes gained tee to green with conventional data by making the proper adjustments. And the way that people talk about strokes gained, like tee to green, it's supposed to be this magical, oh, you can see exactly where they're good. And it, it, I think people have this illusion that it's a lot more precise and it like, gives you this like huge amount of information, like way more than conventional data that is as than is actually warranted by the data. Like if you know that with the proper adjustments, you can get 80% of the way there, tournaments like these are like where you can have an opinion on someone like Burmester, where if you know the right approach, like you're going to be able to put his numbers in context better than people that rely on strokes gains, like T to green doing the heavy lifting for you. Mm -hmm. So I, I absolutely agree with that. I think the, um, there's enough between conventional um, here with the proper adjustments that, yeah, he is probably one of the most intriguing players to me in the field. Conventional wisdom definitely says uh, strokes gained is huge. I mean, just watching the Arnold Palmer this week, I, I was chuckling a couple of times thinking about Colin. Uh, the, the announcer was like, oh, that's why strokes gained is so much better. Uh, they're, they're just, you know, analyzing things. Yeah. I think that contributes to other people who are looking at golf and they're just, you know, it's, it's reinforced a lot, but it, it makes sense to me more, especially after reading your article today, Colin, uh, why you can get, you know, right there with uh, conventional stats. And mm -hmm. this is a perfect example of why you don't want to rely on strokes gained entirely because that data is not available for stuff. Uh, especially for players in this tournament. So Yeah, I mentioned it in passing in the earlier article. PGA is very good about marketing strokes gained as it's oh, yeah. like it's magical metric and look at all the stuff you can do. And to their credit, you the, there are people like opening up the data set that do, are doing great things. Uh, Steve Evans, the head of like information systems on PGA was in panel at Sloan Labs week and he's saying he was surprised by all the other people that use it. It's something like tour professionals to golf course architects to everybody has like great use of shot link for it. But like, I think the DFS crowd just hears that and said, Oh, well, that must mean that it's good for this stuff too. But no, there's like, there's, it's not meant for DFS purposes per se. It doesn't mean it doesn't have value, but I think people just kind of hear the echo chamber and then the DFS community is its own echo chamber, just pair it to the whole time. So there's not a lot of examining basic assumptions that goes along. So that's kind of like, that's, a lot of what went into us designing the product the way that it is at fantasy labs. Yeah. I mean, I, I my, you know, my expertise is more basketball and baseball and some of these other 
sports other than PGA. Um, I, I revert to you guys uh, as far as being the expert on those, but um, I, I can't speak at, to, to those sports. I, I think people are kind of lazy when it comes to data analysis, uh, even in basketball, like people gravitate so much to one number metrics, whether it's like PER or even like the RPM, the real plus minus that ESPN has been really pushing out or even like, you know, college basketball, March Madness is huge. Now, you know, they have these like RPI, BPI stats, like people don't want to have to aggregate a bunch of different stats, even if it's a better sort of, um, you know, that aggregation is going to be more predictive. They, they want a one number stat that's going to tell them how good a, a player or a golfer is that is easy. They don't have to look anywhere else. So I think, I think you're right. I think maybe people are just kind of naturally, um, that sounds great because it's kind of the first one number sort of thing where it's kind of uh, encapsulates how, how good a, a golfer is in one number without having to look at driving accuracy, driving distance, uh, greens hit, fairways hit, stuff like that where you have to aggregate all that stuff. You can have one number and it's, it almost like lets people be lazy. And I think people, unfortunately, are like that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I think laziness is probably like 60, 70% of it. And even among the data crowd, I think the other 30% is this kind of illusion of seven decimal point accuracy, where when you see that what shot link data does, you believe that you can truly know like every facet of a golfer's game and you can be like, Oh, I know how well they do in this situation. And then they match up perfectly with that course. And you really think that you have kind of like that perfect fit and can match up all the data you have with the conditions. And I'm going to get into that next week, but um, yeah. you, that, that is you, the, the idea that you have that level of accuracy is just, it's an illusion and it's not really like, yeah. it's not based in, that's just a common, I guess, like data driven or modeling fallacy. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. Uh, so before we get to the, the players, which we will in just a second, I uh, just kind of want to quickly talk about maybe some important stats for this week. Uh, you know, we talked about the courses really set up for, uh, for Bombers. So I think one important stat, obviously, is going to be driving distance. Uh, but Pete, this is kind of an a interesting thing I want to talk to you about because uh, I think that, you know, you, you and Colin are a good pair to talk every week because you're, uh, you're more narrative street. You know, you, you like watching – uh, uh, golfers like you, you watch all the tournaments you like seeing recent form you're a big believer in like how they're playing now I think Colin's more of into the the data driven approach uh, in kind of a small tournament like this are, are you more inclined to kind of go Colin's route or are you do you still take the uh, the, the kind of the uh, how players are playing now sort of approach I have very few narratives this week. And uh, <laughs> in general, I, I really learned a lot from Colin last week too, just thinking about guys who are undervalued. It's kind of like baseball too. Like um, certain players might get in a slump and if there's no reason for that slump, um, you know, their price goes down and they're undervalued. Uh, and I think the same thing kind of holds true in golf in certain situations. And I'm definitely looking at it more like that. Like Jason Day, perfect example, Colin talked about, hey, this is a golfer that was just owning the entire, you know, he was the guy on the PGA Tour, even ahead of speed at the end of last year. And he's not a 10-8 guy relative to the rest of the field. Um, and I, I definitely am going to be taking that approach. Uh, for this week, in terms of stats, uh, the thing that stands out to me is looking at greens and regulation again. And there's a couple guys – uh, that really stand out that we'll talk about here in a little bit of curious uh, Colin's mm -hmm. opinion on them. Uh, but that's definitely a stat I'm going to be looking at. Uh, definitely looking at the driving guys. I mean, Tony Finau is a guy, you know, not to talk about golfers, but uh, he's the guy that's long and that, uh, you know, played relatively well last week that I think a lot of people know. Uh, so it's interesting thinking about who are some of the guys that people might recognize um, and will they be willing to pay for him? Because, you know, for me, I get, you know, uh, sick to my stomach thinking about playing Graham Dillette at like 6,500, 7,000, whatever price it is. Now he's 11,000, okay, 9,200. McGirt is 10,5. I mean, it's, it's just, it's a uh, tough, yeah. it's a tough week. Uh, from, from a statistical standpoint, uh, the one thing I've identified outside of driving distance is greens and regulation. Curious to hear what Colin has to say in terms of what stats he's looking at. Um, my, honestly, it's, it's a pretty simplified week for me. It's, driving distance and pretty much that's it um i'm sure i mean other stuff is always important but i think some stuff like general long-term form and kind of that's just like overall rating takes care of the rest the only stuff that's really separating this better or worse than expected is driving distance to me so simplified week for me 
Yeah, um, I, I do want to k- kind of hit on, on one more stat before we get to guys, because uh, and it's not necessarily a stat, but uh, I want your thoughts on it. So, like in a normal week, like even last week with the, the Arnold Palmer Invitational, you know, we had the very very top guys like Rory. His odds to win were about seventeen percent. Uh, and in in general, we see when we have a guy like Rory or, or Spieth or, or Day or whoever it may be one of these elite golfers, um, you know, we have guys that are approaching twenty percent. Um, you know, odds to win this week, you know, we have guys, you know, the top guy is about 5% odds to win. So how do you adjust your thinking? Is it, is it maybe, um, you know, even though these guys are, uh, have the highest odds to win, do you maybe put a little less stock into that, um, sort of number just because everyone's so low where it just maybe seems like it's, there's, there's not a, a definitive guy. Maybe it's just kind of just more of a crapshoot of what's going to happen. Um, I, it, it kind of goes a little both ways, actually. So I agree that the tournament is the, when the odds are a little bit flatter, it is a little bit more of a crapshoot, but remember that also bets the benefits, the lower guys too. Cause you know, they yeah. don't, they're not necessarily going to get like just pushed out of the field because right. it's so top heavy and like, they're a lot more open slots in the, in the cut that they can realistically make. So I don't necessarily feel bad about paying up for someone, even though like, you know, they're like, they jump in price $4,000 from last week because they're not actually that good. It's just the feel is actually that bad. But that also means that um, a lot of people on the lower end, like are, they don't increase in price nearly enough. So there are ways to justify spending a lot of money on someone that you've never spent otherwise. So it's, it's, it's not as clear in one either direction, I guess, as you might think. And I think maybe an important point is, you know, obviously, you know, DFS is a zero sum game and obviously we have to worry about ownership and kind of how GPPs match up as far as ownership goes. And, and Pete, you mentioned that before. So maybe this is kind of an important part of ownership where, you know, there should not be a guy that's super high owned in a, in a week where, uh, that the guys, the highest guys odds is 5%. Uh, so maybe you just kind of spread your exposure in a lot of different areas uh, without, you know, putting all of your stock into one necessarily main guy. Or, is that kind of where you're, you're stacking up? It basically eliminates game theory for me. Uh, you know, don't have to think too much. I'm just going to take the golfers that, you know, stand out the most in the data and mm-hmm. uh, go from there. Um, sure. you know, maybe a couple guys, like I think Finau might be one of the guys who might be owned bit more maybe rogers Uh, i know he's been touted a decent bit in the industry so far so in that regard um i might make a couple decisions um with a couple guys but outside of that because there's not that much else i'm not gonna have to think too much about oh this guy is projected slightly worse but he has you know an opportunity to be like one percent owned versus 15 percent owned for a guy or something like that so i'm just gonna trust the data and uh yeah, see, see who comes come, comes out strong in that. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. Maybe maybe game theory doesn't necessarily go out the window, but maybe don't stress about ownership. Just kind of like take the guys you like um, and, and create the best lineups and, and just roll them out. Uh, Fino, I think, is interesting. I think he's kind of a PGA Twitter uh, darling. Uh, Davis Maddock talks about him almost every day, I feel like. so. Um, yeah, so I guess we can get into players on that note. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so let's kind of go through the same sort of tiers. Um, we'll, we'll go um, 9K or more on DraftKings. Um, and then the, the kind of middle tier will be 7 to 8.9. And then the, the lower end tier is going to be less than 7K. Um, so, so we'll start with the higher tier. Uh, and, and I think it'd be interesting to not only not only mention them kind of in comparison to each other, but also in comparison to the field in general. Because I think this is – uh, kind of an important week where like, you know, you may love a guy that's 10, three in comparison to the guy that's nine, five, but you know, if you don't love him more than a guy that's like seven K, I think this is a good week to kind of mention that. Um, Colin, I'll start with you. Where, where, what guys stand out in that sort of top tier for you? So, I mean, we kind of talked about him already a little bit, but uh, Tony Finau is actually like, I, I think he's coming out on tops just on driving distance alone I think that he probably gains the most. I mean, he has the highest, one of the highest driving distances in our player models. And I think that'll help him a lot. Plus his recent results haven't been that bad among actual fields. Um, Patrick Rogers is the other guy where his, his driving distance is high enough there that I think the course fits him like better than some of the other big guys and his track record. He's kind of in the, has similar recent results to Finau. Mm -hmm. Um, 
the other like top end, like the top guys, Graham Delay, William McGurk, Freddie Jacobson, a lot of them don't have great course fits. Their driving distance isn't that high. Um, the one that kind of I think might fly under the radar a little bit in that bracket is Retief Goosen. Uh, he has this nice little stretch recently where he's been making a lot of cuts and putting up like essentially top 25th percentile finishes. Mm-hmm. Um, and just if you think that Fina or Rogers are going to be maybe over owned, I think Goosen is going to fly a little bit more under the radar. Um, and the other guy that we talked a little bit more is uh, Dean Burmester, mm-hmm. who. Um, he's an interesting case. He kind of reminds me of like, do you remember those old like Belmont Bruins, like ba- college basketball teams? They're always like 10th and Ken Palm ratings because they blew out everybody in the Ohio Valley Conference by like 30 points. So like they always end up right. as like a top 15 team. Dean right. Kagan has a similar thing going here where he has amazing adjusted round scores that are going under the hood, but his field score and player models is abysmal. Everyone else averages around like, like, you know, Regular PGA Tour of like 85 percentile, web.com of like 50. He's at 14 because he's getting all of his results on like the European Challenge and South Africa Tour. And right. yep, the only reason that I'm giving at the time of day is his driving distance from those Euro Tours. Crazy. Unreal. I'm wondering like, are they like, is this like a metric system error or something like that where they're recording yeah. it wrong in Europe? I don't know. It's like, I, and I think that I don't know what his ownership is going to be. I haven't heard him talked about a lot, but if I had to lean one way or another, I think the fact that he has zero shot link data on him means a lot of people are going to say, well, I don't know. I don't have opinion on him, but I have plenty of data driven opinions on him. And I think just he's absolutely worth a GPP flyer at the very least. Yeah, no, I love that call. Pete, where, where do you stand on, on those uh, kind of elite guys? Well, I have zero takes after that because that's all the golf I was going to make. The guy is, is on the most of my model based on just the greens and regulation stuff. I mean, even this could be the courses as well for uh, Burmester, but 73.5% greens and regulation, 327.4 driving distance. It's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. Those are two stats I was looking at, and it's like he's bright green on both of them. So right. uh, seems seems like a good play <laughs> pro trends. I mean – don't know anything about the guy. Never seen him golf. Don't even know what he looks like. Maybe I'll go on YouTube and try to find something. But yeah, <laughs> Finau's, Finau's the guy that I'm I'm looking at pretty hard. I think he'll be very, very popular. Yeah. Uh, following DFS Golf Twitter, everyone's talking about him. One guy said he didn't like him that much, and uh, you know, a pretty prominent golf tout, Jabberwock, said, "Yes, please talk people off Finau." Like you know, people are very bullish on this guy. So. Uh, he definitely stands out to me. I think Rogers, another guy I've heard touted quite a bit. That's it. I'm not going to play Graham Dillette. I'm not going to play McGurk. Um, yeah, me neither. I'm just not going to do it. I mean, playing 11,000 for Graham Dillette is just, it's, it's just hilarious. Although the beard, it's, you know, watching the tournament, you don't have any exposure to him. You see the beard, you get a little sad. <laughs> when he misses like a five foot birdie putt or something like that, you'll feel better. <laughs> Yeah, I think the, yeah. The only other guy I think on there, Scott Brown. I think he has the best course history out of everyone there. But I think course history is generally overvalued, and so that's the only reason he's up there, like above ten thousand. Luke Donald rates well for me, but he's not a bomber at all. Uh, no, he has a bad course fit for for me. Right, but except for some reason, and what I have, he's rated well. But I'm staying away because he doesn't meet the the two stats I want. So what do, what do you guys think of uh, Ketchka? You know, obviously defending champ, but in a, in a weird year, his driving distance isn't that high. But, uh, you know, maybe that was negated last year a bit by the fact of, you know, the wind was just so high. So, Colin, what are your thoughts on him? And you, maybe if the wind's going to be higher, this, is he going to get the sort of bump that you would expect? Um, I, in terms of, like, course history, like, I tend to discount course history under really random conditions. Sure. So, like, yeah, he won last year. But, like, if you imagine, if you think of, like, really high wind as, like, every fifth shot is, like, a dice roll or, like, a random number generator, you just don't put as much stock into that. And if, like, someone has to win that tournament, even though it's, like, incredibly random, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, it, I, I don't put a lot of stock into his win just because of like the I mean, conditions were far more random. So it's not necessarily predictive of his true course history going forward. Yeah. And there's like, I think eight guys or something like that tied for a second, just a stroke behind him. So yeah, just ridiculous. Uh, cool. So in this segment, I definitely want to uh, ask you guys for like a, a fade, but it seems like you guys are, are pretty unanimous in, you know, the sort of the top guys, McGirt and Dillette, you guys kind of like those sort of fades. Yeah. Scott Brown's definitely fade for me too. Just too expensive. Same same thing, Pete. 
Yeah, I mean, I haven't made any lineups with Scott Brown, and I see no reason to. So I think that's a fade for me as well. I think we'll see a lot of these guys in like the 8K, 9K range uh, being pretty popular for, for at least what I have in my, my models right now. Cool. Yeah, so uh, let's let's get right into that. Uh, so the next tier we'll hit on is 7K uh, to 8.9, so kind of in between 7 and 9. Uh, and Pete, I'll start with you this time. Uh, what what guys kind of rate highly for you? You're looking in in that range. You said obviously there's some guys that uh, you think you might be really interested in that 8K range. Yeah, Sung you'll know, know is rating well for me um, and my my stuff. I'm not sure he's a great <laughs> play, but uh, you know he's rating well for me currently in, in, in my stuff. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there's a couple guys that I, I'm curious uh, Colin's opinion on. Jonathan Vegas is rating somewhat high. I generally stay completely away from him, but I know I have to at least consider him um, in, in this spot. Um, and then the guy who's rated really high, and I don't know that much about him, um, but very, very curious the opinion, Colin, if you have one, is uh, Gregory Birdie, uh, another guy with higher green regulation. His driving distance is marginal. It's the average 26.1, but uh, he's rating pretty high for me. He's right at 7K, so I guess he's kind of towards the lower end, but – uh, that's a guy who's rating well. So curious the opinions there. I'm not sure to be totally honest. Again, this is a tournament where I'm just relatively lost, but, um, yeah, those are the guys who are rating well for me currently. Well, I mean, his name is birdie. So uh, Bordy, Bordy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know uh, anything yeah. about this guy, Colin? No. And like, I get, he's not on my radar at all. And like, there's some guys that popped up in my models occasionally where I'm like, I, I'm not quite sure about that. So I'd have to dig into him. Like, I'm just taking a look at. He just uh, has elite greens and regulation. And that's probably why. And driving accuracy too. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, really I, good I, too, yeah. Yeah. So I think like so why why aren't I super high in him? So like one like I I I think I'm valuing just like pure distance more than GIR on your case. So like that may explain right. why it's a little bit higher on your end. Um, zero course history. I mean that's kind of like a that that doesn't explain like that big a drop off. Um, but yeah, I'd probably have to get into his like yes. actual results and try to figure out like Vegas is one who kind of meets. I mean, he's got pretty good driving stuff, but I just, he's a guy I just can't trust. But I guess I have to consider him in this spot. Yeah, no. The, so the other two guys you mentioned, uh, Vegas and uh, Sung, you'll know. Like they're they're definitely on my mid tier uh, list. Like I I agree with those a hundred percent. Um, the other ones that I like in the mid tier right now are the Kyles, uh, Kyle Stanley and uh, Kyle Reefers. And those, I think they're getting a little bit of chatter for like a solid mid-range play. Um, but yeah, they're, they're the ones that are popping for me. Um, there's, it's not necessarily great um, course fit. I think it's kind of like average in both directions. I think they just kind of have some of those, like they're on the fringes and kind of have a decent smattering of like close cut misses and um, decent finishes on the regular tour that um, they're normally coming in around like, you know, like 7,000 or something like that. And I don't think they're getting priced up enough for this much weaker field. Forty has good line movement already, FYI. Okay. So, like, no, no, I, haven't even looked at, I haven't looked at line movement at all. This not week. much has happened, right? I mean, it's Tuesday. Uh, this is a tournament that I assume is not facilitating <laughs> that right. much action. Right. Uh, but he's already moved relative to where he was. And it's that not a gigantic move, but – that was another reason I liked him. Okay. That, that might another be... reason I was considering him just based on fantasy labs and that again, I don't know that much about these guys. So I am really relying on, you know, fantasy labs and Colin here. Yeah. And, and maybe the fact that uh, it's not a huge term, maybe live movement means even a little bit more in a tournament like this. Uh, Colin, one guy I want to ask you uh, about before I ask for phase and then move into the lower tier, Luke List. He's at eight six. He has elite driving distance. He is the second highest driving distance behind our our favorite Burmester. He, he's just going to be our guy this week, I think. Uh, and really great. Uh, I think he's got good green and regulations as well. Um, but not not a, not a crazy high rating. Um, you know, how, how do you feel about him? Yeah, I looked at him too, just because his driving distance is so huge. And like, if there's everything you want to focus on, it'd be great. Yeah. Um, I think he just has, like, he is, I, I think he'd be fine for, like, like a GPP or something like that. But just mm -hmm. if you click on his game log alone in uh, Fantasy Labs. Not great, literally. Like, it, yeah. it is, it is, it makes Tony Fino look consistent. Like, it's, <laughs> it's just, like, monster, like, three monster finishes and, like, ten miscuts. So, I think there's just, 
too many, like his overall rating just isn't going to get high enough. Sure. And so that's where like, if you skirt the line between like buddies, a boomer and his like general long-term results, I think long-term results are bad enough at this point to outweigh the fact that he's like, he can crush it. Worth the GPP. If you're going many though. Yeah. I mean, I like, he's that definition of boomer bust. Like I wouldn't put him yeah. in all of them, but like have a couple where like, sure. you know, you have high risk, high reward. Yeah, for sure. Uh, cool. Yeah. Kyle Stanley, just looking at him more, I was just researching, it looks like his adjusted round is really high, and I think that that makes sense. And same with no, that's the reason he was waiting well for me as well. But uh, Kyle Stanley, I like that call, Colin. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so this might be tough just because like, everyone's kind of a fade, but is there any like, uh, is there any any in this, in this tier that is a fade, whether it's because you think they're going to have higher ownership or uh, you just don't think that they're worth the value? Um, Colin, I'll start with you and then go to Pete. I mean, any, any guys stand out as guys that you're not super interested in more so than others? Um, I don't know. I, I don't really have a great sense of ownership as far as like what people, I mean, like list is probably that, that, I mean, that's the kind of the high risk, high reward. That's not, I wouldn't necessarily yeah. call it fade. Um, I think John Curran probably waits like the, the least of all those mid tier guys. David Toms is not coming out really well at all either. Um, who else? I've uh, heard people talk about Will McKenzie. You have an opinion on him? Let's see. Pro- probably not a good one. I'm looking him up now. Like, eh, he's, he's middle. Of the, he doesn't jump out at me. I think he's very middle of the pack. He's always been middle of the pack this year. Um, yeah, he's a low just, range uh, model, yeah. Doesn't yeah, drive it super far, yeah. Yeah, just kind of a blah, like, no, I don't, I, I'm not even going to, like, dignify him with an opinion. Just comes out as a nothing. And he's a big bogey guy. Like, he, uh, yeah, has a lot of downside, it kind of looks like, from the data. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Pete, you got any strong takes on guys to fade? Do you want to move the, the kind of lower range? Let's keep it moving. I mean, again, this is, you know, I think the fades would be really important for other tournaments, especially sure. like the Masters, where yeah, we'll have yeah, a lot to talk about, and game yeah. theory will be really interesting. This, again... I think just trust the data, and if you have a reason to go with the guys and you like driving distance and they're adjusted round and whatever, it lines up, play them. Don't worry yeah. about ownership. No one's part of these guys anyway. Don't worry about ownership and fading and having strong opinions. Right. People you'll never see again for the rest of the year. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, that's definitely fair. Okay, let's uh, let's keep on moving to the lower tier, which we're going to classify as under 7K, so 6.9 or less. Uh, and it actually goes down pretty, pretty low. Uh, the cheapest, the, the min salary guys are four seven on DraftKings this week. So uh, definitely, you have a big difference between like a four seven guy and eleven k guy. Usually, they're you know the lowest guys are in like the you know right at six k range. So um, yeah, I mean, a- any guys interest you, Colin? We'll, we'll start with you in, in this kind of seven k and under range. Yeah. So the guy that pops above all else, and I'm still kind of trigger trying to figure out why, is uh, Carlos Ortiz. And I think it, he's had kind of like middling results, kind of like makes every other cut on the main tour and like his misses aren't that bad. So he's just kind of like one of those, like he's kind of a plotter on the regular tour that like it, it's nothing flashy, but like occasionally gets points. And I think just his price hasn't gone up enough in this wide open field to, he's not a 66, he's like a 6,000 or like on the regular tour. Um, and I don't think like he should only go up 600 for what his results are so far. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I think who's the other guy? Um, Tom Hodge, Hodge. I don't, I don't know how, how pronounced half of these ones. Um, he is another, I think, classic case of he has really bad course history, but I think that is dipping into his price too much for how important course history actually is. Mm-hmm. So again, kind of a, um, uh, Otherwise, I kind of a similar plotter to Ortiz, um, but I think his price has gone down too much because of some bad, some course history results. Cool, uh, Pete. You got any, any strong opinions on these lower end guys? All in on John Daly. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a fade for you right there, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> John Daly. Um, you know, these guys, uh, Ortiz pops pretty high for me. Um, and then it's a bunch of guys that I, I mean, I have no idea. <laughs> they're in good plays or, or, or not. Uh, I'd be lying to you. Some guys who I recognize, 
that are like Rory Sabatini is rating pretty high for me. I know who that is. I have no idea if that's a, if he's a good player or not, but he's rating somewhat high uh, in my model, I guess, on Fantasy Labs. Um, there's a couple other guys. This is Stefani. I remember looking at. Is he in this tournament? Stefani? He is. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's in that range, and I, I like just watching him. I think he has talent, but uh, not sure if he's a great play. He's not even rating that well for me. So I'm I'm pretty lost here. Ortiz is a guy I was going to bring up, and if, if Colin likes him, if he stands out. That's probably what I'll be doing this week. So, uh, you know, I don't know all the guys in the tournaments, even in the high tier range, you know, dumpster bin diving here with these guys. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's definitely tricky. Uh, so I'll probably build a more balanced roster again, just because I'll be fading a lot of the really expensive guys. Uh, mm-hmm. So I probably won't have to take too much in consideration, but Ortiz, he pops my model and Colin likes him. So that's the direction I'm thinking now. Cool. I like it. Uh, Colin, let me ask you about a couple guys here, yeah. I mean, and then we'll kind of finish. Um, just kind of guys that, that stood out to me and curious. Uh, first one is Brendan Todd. You know, it's a guy who plays in kind of the, the harder tournaments. So, you know, he really rates really well as far as, like, field percentage, which you talked about uh, earlier, um, and, and rates well in some other metrics as far as, you know, driving accuracy and, uh, um, you know, bogey avoidance and stuff like that. So uh, and he's 6'5", so, you know, a guy who you know, plays in some harder fields and per- – you know, potentially, you know, might have seen a, a bigger increase than, you know, what he has. He's a 6'5". Uh, so, curious your thoughts on him. And then also Steve Marino. He's at 5'5". I, again, I know nothing about him. He doesn't have, a, like, great odds to win. But he's another guy who rates really well in driving distance and, and greens and regulation and is super cheap. So, um, yeah, maybe a GPP flyer or – no. So I think so. Brendan Todd, I would still say no. So just like, I'm looking at his game log, and I think in his last like, I mean, I I know I'm big on long term form and stuff like that, but sometimes you can just like, so I'll just eyeball like short term form and see like, okay, so maybe something truly has broken. And if there's ever a guy where like he just forgot how to play golf, according to his log, it's Brendan Todd. Yeah. It's literally okay. one made cut in the last like eleven tournaments or something. So, like, if, yeah. I think that's just too much for me to say, like, okay, you know what, I, I know he has plenty of, like, great long-term results from a year ago, but if, there ever, if there's ever a time where those can get swamped and, like, to, okay, he's forgotten something, it's now. So, sure. it's no one, Todd. Sure. I think Steve Marino is one of, he is my, uh, one of my two favorites under 6K. Um, he's kind of a similar to one to Ortiz where kind of plods along and, uh, is like makes every other tournament and like some of the other PGA ones. And I think um, he would be probably like, you know, 5,000 on a regular tournament and 5,500 is not enough of a price increase at um, this crapshoot. Um, so I'd agree with Marino, disagree with Todd. The other guy I like actually under 6K is uh, Michael Kim. Uh, who he's relatively new to the tour, so not a great sample, but he's got a good, like, you know, I think like 15 tournaments at least under his belt now. And mm-hmm. he's always just kind of like on the edge of the top 100 as far as like my, my overall ratings and does a decent job making cuts and like doesn't necessarily have like a ton of upside, I think. But I think relative to this field, like he could do just fine and put up like a solid top 30 finish. Cool. Uh, yeah, no, I, I like that a lot. I think it's a good, very interesting tournament. Um, definitely, you know, one to, I think, use our data as much as possible. Uh, if you want to get a trial or obviously a subscription or whatever you would like to do, you know, we would encourage that. I think there's a lot of really good stuff in the player models. You can obviously adjust all of the sort of, uh, you know, potential ratings that you'd like, whether you, you know, really want to rate driving distance high, like we, you know, said. I think we is going to be important. You can do that as high as you want, uh, but play around with the models. I think it's going to be an interesting week to play uh, and have some fun and some tournaments. Um, models are still still free too right now. We're in beta for a couple more weeks, which oh is yeah, great. yeah, so yeah, true. Check them out right now, and this is probably the week where if you are playing PGA DFS, I admire the spirit and uh, mm-hmm. you know going after it this week, and I think this week more than others. Uh, the data is going to be really, really important. I'm always trying to be data driven, but you know, there's no narratives here unless you really, really follow the tour. You're not going to know many of these guys yeah. and uh, it's a time to follow the data more than ever. So check them out. Cool. I like it. Uh, yeah, I guess we'll end it there. Um, we have next is it, do they usually, uh, next week's the shell Houston open. Is that, we assume that's going to be on DraftKings. I think that's going to be a regular tournament. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Cool. Uh, so, well, yeah, we'll be back as, as regular next Tuesday. And then the following week is obviously the Masters. So uh, getting into, I think, some good golf. I think the match play will be fun to watch. Uh, maybe the Puerto Rico Open won't be as fun to watch, but maybe uh, you know you can take down a tournament and it'll be fun in that regard. So uh, nothing gambling can't solve. Exactly, we're all about that here. Uh, cool. All right, Colin P. Thanks for joining me. Uh, talk to you guys next Tuesday, right? Looking forward to it. Yep, sounds good. Cool. All right, thanks for listening, guys. Uh, you know, good luck this week. Hopefully, you guys take down a tournament in this awesome uh, Puerto Rico Open. Uh, I'll talk to you guys next week.